We've been going through this series of messages about uh, the kingdom of God and what that looks like, an upside down kingdom. And uh, today I, we're continuing the same text. And so if you want to open up in your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verse 31, Matthew 5, 31. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you or you don't have an electronic one, there's a gray one in front of you, and I'll just give you the page for that one. That's 1,223, 1,223. Uh, when most of us think about marriage, most of us come into the idea that it's going to last a lifetime. Most of us coming in the idea of marriage that somehow we will get through difficulties, there'll be tough times, but we, you know, we're gonna, it's going to be good, we're going to make this, we're going to make it last forever. Very few people really, I believe, would come into a marriage totally anticipating divorce, right? I mean, you know, no one says, I'm going to get married today, uh, if I make it a year, uh, I'll be good. I mean, no, most people don't do that. You know, unless you're looking for money or something weird, but then you got a whole other issue, if that's the case. But we really think that marriage is going to be a place where we'll find a lifetime friend, a helper, a partner, and, and that'll last a, a long time. Um, we expect difficulties, right? For the most part, if you're married, you kind of expect that to be the case, and you expect you'll overcome it. Um, but here's the deal. It's not always the case. Uh, people get divorced. As a matter of fact, the statistics hold true. Uh, at least half of you are here today that are over the age, you know, if you've been married, half of you have been divorced. Um, and the crazy thing is they even have a new statistic saying that the divorce rate is going down. Uh, but what they don't tell you is that the marriage rate also is going down. So more and more people are simply not even getting married. It's just been such a tough situation. They're like, why should I even get married? I'm just going to get divorced anyway. And, and so we are really in a place of, you know, what does God have to say about it? You know, and speaking of what does God have to say about it, let's just kind of rewind where we've been at. Is, do we really believe that true joy, that true meaning, that true purpose, that everything that we have in life really, the most, that it comes from being in, in the kingdom of God? I mean, is that really what we believe? Do we really believe that our most fulfilling life comes when we live within the realm of God as he leads and as he guides? Or do we really believe that our, our truest sense of life and meaning and purpose really kind of comes through fulfilling my own needs and my own wants, my own desires, whatever feels good at the moment, or do we believe that? And I think most people that are following Christ or trying to would, would say, no, 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 no. We, I believe it comes from God. That's where fulfillment comes. But I want to suggest to you this, that what you say you believe isn't what you really believe, Right? What you do is what you believe. Are you with me? Like, so what you really live, how you live your life is a reflection of what you really believe. So we can say we believe this, but if we live this, then this is where we really believe. Right? As a matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus said some things. I just want to go back. Uh, Jesus said this that, that in John 10.10, 10, that the thief, this world system that we, our cultural system that we live in, that we, that we engage every day, um, this world system has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he says this in John 10, 10, that, that I have come to give life. Like, do we believe it? I mean, how many really believe that Jesus, the creator of heavens and earth, your maker, really came to give you life to the fullest? Like, do we really, really believe it? Because if we really believe it, then our life will show it, right? Our life will show it. I looked up a couple other verses. Just, it was like, you know, encourage me. And I, I just needed encouragement. Matthew 6, 33 says this. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek his path, his ways, his life, what, what's most important to God's kingdom. And everything else will be added to us. Like, that's what he says. That everything else, according to his will, of course, will be, like in our life in the fullest, will be added to us. And there's something real paradoxical, really crazy, Matthew 10, 39. It says, if you really want to find true life, 
If you really, 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 really want to find meaning in life, if you really want to find joy and purpose and, and everything that life is supposed to be, and this is what's so crazy, Jesus says you have to lose it. And that, just think about that for a moment. So to live, look at the water baptism tank. You guys can't see it. I know it's there. So to live as God would call us to, he would say this, that to really live life to the fullest, we need to die to all of our wants, our desires, and in so doing, we live in him. That, that's the challenge we've been talking about. Um, before I continue on, I, I just want to talk to if you're a single people for a moment, and I'm going to come back to you at the end as well, but I just want to sh- share a few thoughts. Um, if you're single, this message totally applies to you as well. And this is why. Single people, you, you really need to know uh, what marriage is about before you enter into it. And so if you're single, you're thinking, this isn't for me. No, it's totally for you because you, you need to know why you're getting married and why you're interested. What's it all about? Number two, um, when you think you may have found your future spouse, be sure that you can accept them just the way you are, that they are. So single person, if you're, you're at a place where you're looking for somebody, and I just want to encourage you, when you think you found somebody, ask yourself this question. Could I spend the rest of my life with that person just as they are? Now, you might be hoping for some change. But if you're thinking you're going to do the changing, you're mistaken. So you need to make sure that you accept them where they are today. Because they may never change. Number three, um, this is just, uh, I'm just going to real as I can get. If you really have a fear um, and you're getting engaged or dating somebody and you really have a fear that your future spouse could potentially have an affair, um, could easily divorce you, uh, somewhat uh, maybe abusive or even, even this, even as unwilling to work through struggle and conflict, for goodness sakes, don't get married. Don't, don't, like, I'm just telling you guys, like, sometimes we, this is the cultural thing. We just jump in, and we're like, yay, and all of a sudden, like, we're in sinking sand, right? And we're like, help me, and I'm just saying, I'm just trying to forewarn you, like, know what you're getting. I love being married. Don't misunderstand me. Monica's not here, but if she was, she'd be right there. I love being married. I love it, but it's, it's, it's not for everybody I'm going to talk about in a moment, and it's not easy, but it, it is awesome. Right? But know what you're getting into. So that's just kind of a, a side deal for single people. I just don't want single people to shut me out because I need to hear this. And then finally, uh, for single people, listen, um, don't date to date. I, I have said this for years and years and years. Um, if you're dating because everybody else is finding someone to date, you're setting yourself up for failure in the future. You Listen, listen. You... You're conditioning your mindset that when you're dating somebody and things don't go well, you break up, right? Four or five years or whatever of doing that, not going well, we break up. Not going well, we break up. Not going well. We're Scott. I need a song. Not going well, we break up. You, you get into a marriage situation, and why would you expect everything you've been doing for your whole life to change in a day? And, and so I'm just, just hear me. Don't date for dating. That, I mean, the whole, like, I've got to find someone to make me feel comfortable and happy in myself. You're never going to find happiness until you find it in Jesus alone. I'm just saying. And so don't, so don't try to find this some person to give you meaning and purpose and value because that's something only Jesus can do. Can do. Your spouse will never give you the meaning that you want. And all that was free. So... <laughs> Now back to the regular scheduled message. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is going through these, these questions we've been talking about, uh, com- commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, and he's, he's really dealing with some issues with, uh, you know, really who's blessed, what's the best life, who is good, what does that look like? And in Matthew chapter 5, he comes up with this issue of divorce, the issue of divorce. And, and here's what it says. So as if it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife 
must give her a certificate of divorce. And so in, in that culture, that culture, if you could get divorced for any reason you wanted to, but for goodness sake, be a good person and give them a certificate that says that it wasn't an affair, you know, just be good. But you could do whatever you wanted to. And so the question is, is that really good? Is that really God's plan? Is that really how it's supposed to be? And so in your notes, write, write this down if you would. A misconception number three, this is week three in this topic, misconception number three is just do the divorce right. So misconception number three is just do the divorce right. Get a certificate of divorce. And we don't even do that today, and so that doesn't mean a whole lot of sense to us, but it will in a moment. So he goes on and said, what, is, what was the really meaning of the law? What was it really supposed to mean? I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And what does all that mean, and how does it apply to us today, and what, what should we do with it? And so that's what we're going to walk through. For further clarity, you really have to go to Matthew chapter, ch- chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. And here's the question. So all the religious leaders are there, and, and, and they're, they go to Jesus, and they say this. They say, Jesus, um, can you divorce your wife for any and every reason? Now, today is, what, 2019? If we read that verse, can you divorce your wife for any and every reason as a Christian, how many think that's kind of a stupid question? I mean, don't we think that's kind of like, why would they ask that? Like, what, like of course not. That's what we think because we know what the answer is going to be. But Jesus has taken us to a place what's really going on in that culture, something that we need to kind of walk through to understand what's happening and how we live our lives. And so it's really a trick question. What was happening is, is there was two predominant groups going on. There was one group that said, essentially, we talked about this last week, but you can divorce your wife for any reason at all. She doesn't cook well. She gained weight. Uh, you found someone more attractive. Any reason, just divorce her, but obey the law, give her a certificate of divorce, for goodness sake. The other group said, no, no, there's some reasons why you have to have a divorce. You can't just say for any reason. But anybody knew what it really was. And so here's what's happening. They're trying to trap Jesus in this deal. They're trying to get him stuck, right? Don't they do that a lot if you read the Gospels? They try to get him like pivoted against two groups. How's Jesus going to deal with this? (laughs) But like Jesus' style, he totally avoids the question altogether and he gets to the root of it. So Jesus says this, don't you know that Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because why? Because your hearts were hard. But it was not that way from the beginning. So Jesus says this, when Moses gave you the law, this is important, listen to this, when Moses gave you the law, he gave it to you in this area because your heart was hard. And in that culture, if you were a female, you had very little rights at all. As a matter of fact, if, if, you, were, you, know, if you were a female, you could be abused, you could be hurt, you could be mistreated, and nothing would really happen a whole lot. So essentially, God is saying this, listen, I'm going to allow you to divorce her for her protection. Now, hang on. I'm going to allow you to divorce her for her protection, but when you do it, give her a certificate so that not everyone thinks that she's an adulterer or that she did something wrong. God is totally trying to protect the ladies. Now, this is going to make a huge sense in a moment. So he says... Because of the hardness of your heart, I will allow you to divorce her. In divorcing her, give her a certificate. Why did she need a certificate? We said last week that there's three things she could do. She could, she could go live with a relative that was nice. Good luck with that. She could find another guy. But let's be honest, she was considered damaged goods. Or she could be a prostitute. That's all she had. Different culture. And so a certificate of divorce said this, hey, I'm okay. I didn't cheat on my husband. I just made a bad meal or whatever. It was kind of the way of saying that she's okay and that, yes, you can marry her. And listen, and we're going to talk about this other verse in a moment. You can marry her. You, you know, you can whatever. She's okay. Well, let me go back to that hardness of the heart. This is... This is where it comes into play in our lives. You remember the verse that says this in Romans. It says, God gave them over 
Remember that? To a depraved mind. This is very important. Sometimes God speaks in our lives and he deals with an issue in us. And he's working in our heart and he's saying, I want you to do this or I want you to do that. And we're like, no, God, I can't do it. I can't do it. Just listen. If we're not careful in God's grace, he's actually going to give you over to a hardened heart. Does that make sense? God, God in his grace Instead of keep fighting with you nonstop, he's going to say, listen, if that's what you want, go ahead. Go ahead. That scares me. Because I know the situations in my life that I know God had been saying, listen, this is what I want from you. This is, and especially in my giving world, this is what I want you to do. But you know what? If you're going to do this, Jason, I'm going to love you anyway, but I'm giving you over to your own hardened heart. When God gives us over to our own hardened heart, we reap that hardness of heart and the consequences of it. Sometimes we tend to blame God for those consequences, and the whole time God was trying to save us. Does that make sense? And so if God's stirring you and God's working on you, don't allow your heart to be hardened. Just say, God, give me a new heart. Change me. I want to do what you want me to do, whatever it is. Change the way I think. Don't allow your heart to be hardened, right? So moving on. So he says, give them a certificate of divorce because of a hardened heart. Give them something that, that, so the lady can at least go on. And, and so he says, hey, it was never my will. For divorce. There's never how I wanted it. This is such a crazy statement. Such a crazy statement that the disciples respond in, in, in that verse, 19 verse, where are we at? 19.8, a little bit further down. When God says it was never my will, it was never God's plan, here's what the disciples said. If this is a situation between a husband and wife, if if God always wanted them together, if God always wanted them to stay together and divorce wasn't supposed to happen, disciples, who are the disciples? Like Jesus is elite, right? This is like Jesus is hangboys. These are the ones that are the spiritual, spiritual people to an extent. Here's what they said. This is their response. If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry Do you get a taste of the culture a little bit? The disciples, the inner core, divorce and all this separation, things are happening in such a mess that when Jesus says it wasn't meant to be that way, their logical conclusion is, man, I should just be single the rest of my life because I don't want to deal with that. So we need to work that through. What does all that mean? What is that? It's an upside down kingdom. It's, it's radical departure from, from um, the cultural norms. Let me just hit this last sentence and then I want to talk about the meaning of marriage and why marriage is so stinking awesome. I don't know why. It just is. Just work with me. At least, uh, yeah. So go back to this verse. I, I misunderstood this for years. Some of you, some of you really wise people are like, oh, I knew this, but here we go. So Jesus says, but I tell you anyone, I can see it this way, you read it that way. But I tell you anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness, look at that word, causes her to become an adulteress. I used to look at this for years, and here's what I used to think. I I told people all the time. I used to think it meant that if someone got divorced, and you married them, you walked straight into adultery. Shame on you. And it does mean that to an extent. But the slam, if you will, the rebuke, if you will, is not to the lady. It's to the guy that divorced her. Do you see this? This goes back to what we talked about a few weeks ago. But so the slam, the rebuke is to the guy that said, hey, I can't take anymore. I'm leaving you. I'm letting you go. The slam is on the divorcer, not as much as on the divorcee, because a slam says that you caused 
her to walk into it. In that culture, if you were late and you got divorced, you just weren't sing- living single the rest of your life. I mean, you had to get married or you died. Like you essentially, in your selfish act, in your self-righteousness, you caused someone to walk into an act of adultery and caused the person to marry her to do the same. That's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? Why does that matter? It matters because two verses ago or two sections ago, Jesus talked about the fact that we're to love one another and care for one another and be there for one another and when there's offense to deal with the offense and not to want someone else to stumble and fall, right? I'm I'm going too, too forward. Let me just rewind a moment. So why, why does marriage matter? Let's just go there, and then I'll come back to that idea. Okay, why does marriage matter? Uh, by the way, a, a great book is The Meaning of Marriage. I forget who the author is. Yeah, Timothy Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. It does a great job of explaining why we get married. And let's just be, let's just be real. My wife doesn't hear this service, so when I, when I went to my wife, um, and she was right here last service to so just work with me, imaginary lady, um, <laughs> We were in Philadelphia, and I like, you know, I had the tulip, and I did my best to be romantic with the ring inside the tulip. Um, anyway, so I was like, honey, will you marry or will you marry me? This is a great story. I didn't tell this first service. And <laughs> when she said yes, she took the flower that had the ring inside of it, and she put it around me. <laughs> and where did the ring go? No idea. It took off, and we searched for hours. Anyway. So when, when I asked her to be my wife, can I just be transparent with you? I, I didn't ask Monica to be my wife because I thought that she would help me be a better man. I didn't ask her to be my wife because I thought she would help me to grow and work through the weaknesses that I had. I, I, didn't, I didn't ask her. I never thought she'd rebuke me really ever. I, mean, I knew we'd have conflict, but it would be her fault. And I would help her maybe, you know, as a good, generous guy that I am get through that and I walked into the marriage with this idea that it was kind of a friend for life like you're the one I want to spend the rest of my life with and we can have kids together or whatever and, and um, the kids can just destroy our lives in so many ways and cause <laughs> pain and conflict and all kinds of anyway um, so have kids together and there'll be great wonderful children who will love us even when they're 13 and 14 and seven, anyway, 17 and <laughs> So the idea of marriage for me was like just kind of hanging out for life with some extracurricular activities. That was my idea of marriage. So when God looks at marriage, there's a couple of reasons why marriage is so huge. And and the first one is this, because marriage is God's design through mutual maturity and mutual growth. Did you realize that? That, that marriage is God's way. Genesis 2, 24, a man will leave his family. So the man leaves his family, is united to his wife, and the two become what? One. And in that oneness, they grow stronger together. In that oneness, they mature one another. Let me put it a different way, a couple other ways. When you're, when you're by yourself, you can see somebody's flaws like, man, he's really impatient or he's really mean. And you see it, but most of the time you don't have to deal with it. You can just walk away, right? In marriage, you see it, you don't get to walk away. That's not bad. That's good. Because in marriage is the situation where you actually get to work through the difficulties, work through the negative parts of your life, where you have someone that you can trust saying, listen, listen, babe, man, I know you're trying to be nice, but you're really being a jerk. How can we help each other out in this thing, right? So marriage is the place where you actually help each other grow in love and in trust more like Jesus. Marriage is meant to help you mature. Let me give you another example. If you if you if you if you on a bridge and it's an older bridge and you take your little your little Volkswagen 
my cute Volkswagen, and you go over the bridge, and that's your daily trip, um, you're going to think everything's fine. But if you take a 10-ton truck to go over that same bridge, how many know that that 10-ton truck is going to highlight the cracks and the weaknesses in the bridge? That 10-ton truck will put weight, and here's what it'll do. The 10-ton truck, this is important. Some of you get married. Some of you are married, and you're missing this. The 10-ton truck doesn't make the weakness. The 10-ton truck reveals the weakness. In your marriage, your spouse didn't make your weakness. Your spouse revealed what was already there. And so your responsibility isn't, I'm not taking any more 10-ton 10 10 trucks on the bridge. My responsibility is to, wow, my baby showed me some weaknesses in my life, and I need to work on those cracks. Somebody? I'm just saying, some of us are missing this up in marriage. We, we think that our spouse is the one that causes stuff. They're not. It's the real you. Look in the mirror. It's you. And so instead of running away from that in a true trust relationship, you work together in peace and grace and harmony, and you work towards having the, the fruit of the Spirit. That's what marriage is good for. That's one of the key reasons to get married. I mean, me go back to the text, if, if you can. If you have it open, it's page one, two, two, three, one, two, two, three. So Jesus, Jesus goes through this fulfillment of the law and how he came to fulfill the, uh, the law and not do away with it. And his order, I don't think, is by chance. First thing he does is he deals with murder. And he says, no, no, the true issue isn't just murder, it's the resentment, it's the anger. And here's what he says, that, that you have to value people. And so in your anger, don't sin. Like in your anger, deal with the anger, walk through it. As a matter of fact, don't become resentful, don't become bitter, talk to one another. He even says later on, before you try to be all spiritual and Jesus-like, like, before you try to live it, like show it, right? Isn't that what the verse says? It says... Uh, da, 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 do, 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 do. Where am I at? Verse 23, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar and go and be reconciled. So deal with the situation. Don't become bitter and angry and upset. So that's the first thing. This is for everybody. The second thing that we went through is adultery starting in verse 27. And in this thing, Jesus says, the issue in the law isn't just don't commit adultery. The issue is don't even allow a lustful idea to enter your heart. And lustful we defined as essentially um, allowing something to exist that doesn't have a right to. That's the way I I would paraphrase it. You wrote it down last week. It might be in your notes. But to lust means that you, you, are, you awaken or you allow a hidden or a desire that's not supposed to be alive. You, you sit on it. So to lust for somebody means that you, like, this isn't mine to be thinking about you in that way, but I am, and that's, that would be sin. That would be destroying God's plan for your life. And so for a girl, you know, it might be the way someone looks, but it might be relational stuff, right? Remember this from last week if you were here? There's different things that guys deal with, different things that girls deal with. So the first one in this whole deal is first... Deal with your anger, deal with your bitterness, deal with resentment. Don't just, let, don't just let it go away. Talk about it. Number two, hey, man, don't be lusting for people. Don't be having hidden desires of things that aren't yours. Man, treat people fairly. Treat them kindly. Treat them with respect. Honor people. Then we get to divorce. Check this out. If you're married, you, you'll know this is true. As a married couple, if you deal with the anger and the resentment and the bitterness, if you deal with the lust and wanting things that aren't rightfully yours, how many of you know that marriage and divorce is a lot less, like, right? Amen. I would go as far as to say, I bet you 90% people never get divorced if they first deal with, hey, unresolved conflict, anger not dealt with, um, hurts not talking about, 
lusting for people that I shouldn't be having, creating emotional uh, companionship. If they deal with those, most marriages are fine. Amen. True? True? So I don't think it's a coincidence. Let me get number two. Why is, why is marriage so important, number two? And there's a mini, but I'm only going to do two. Um, because number two, it's really, it's God's design for raising a family. It really is. I'm, so I know, I know you know this, but uh, men and women are different in many ways. Uh, and they take, in a marriage, in a family, it takes both parts, both parts of, of that relationship to help lead a family. And, and if you do a, just a survey over the, new, over the Bible, you're going to find often that the men tend to be more disciplinarians out of love, disciplinarians, they tend to be more like leading towards the future, tend to be more equipping, and you find usually that the moms are what? Usually more nurturing. The more like, sweetie, it's okay. You're going to do okay. And dad's like, come on, dude, let's go. Usually. Sometimes it's opposite, and there's no rule, but there's that healthy deal in a relationship. And so uh, that's God's design for a family. And um, write down this, if you would. Look up Institute for Family Studies. They do a lot of studies about this. And, and because it's our cultural fight right now is what does a family look like, uh, it's a great resource for you. Um, and... Just getting remarried doesn't make it easier. So I've met with several people uh, in, the, in the past, especially uh, this week, and, and said, you know, so how, what's that like? Walk me through. Uh, so you have children, you were married, and then you got divorced. Like, how's that going for you? They all say, man, the whole kids thing is so tough. The grass is not greener on the other side. Now, they're not saying, I'm, I wish I wasn't married to this new person. They're not saying that, but they are saying that, that I, I thought it would be easier than it is. So just stick around for a moment. Let me just deal with two, two topics, and then I'm going to close it. What if I've been divorced? What if I was divorced for a reason that wasn't biblical? I just, you know, I had a relationship with somebody, and I'm like... I just I left my spouse and I went with them. Um, how do I go forward with that? What if, what if I indeed, uh, I knew God was telling me not to get divorced, but um, he gave me over to my hardened heart. What do I do? Can I just speak life to you for just a moment? Listen, whether you've been divorced once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times, this is so important. God's grace is always sufficient. Always. So no matter where you are in your life, God's grace is sufficient for that place in your life. No matter what the reason was that happened in your life, whether it was your fault, his fault, nobody's fault, God's grace is sufficient for today. If you don't believe me, write this verse down. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. He who is in Christ as a new creation. Now, we think that verse just means I got saved and now I'm a new... No, 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 no. Here's what it means. It means that every time we come to Christ, every time we fail and we go to Christ and we say, Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? At that moment, we become a new birth, a new creation in Christ, that all things have passed away and new things begun to come forward. Amen. That's huge. Because I know when talking to divorced people that some of you live in condemnation and second-guessing yourself and you live in doubts every day. And I just want to encourage you, let the past stay in the past, let today be today, and let tomorrow keep you forward. Amen? So you're, you're not receiving any rebuke from this preacher. You're not receiving any condemnation from our church. We're simply saying that the place that you are now today, your best life is yet ahead to so do it Jesus' way. Amen. Amen? Amen? Number two, kind of a side note. There are still situations where divorce is by far the best option. Jesus never commands divorce. He never says, if there is an affair, then you have to get divorced. He never says that. As a matter of fact, I, I know about a half a dozen people that there was affairs in their marriages, and they fought through it, and they were healthier in it. Not thankful for it, 
but healthier in it, that they became healthier on the other side. So I've seen many, many marriages thrive after an affair. That being said, there are times when, yes, uh, when there's abuse, for goodness sake, protect yourself and your family. Sexual immorality. You know what? If, I mean, if, if your spouse isn't repentant, if your spouse had an affair and they're not repentant and they keep doing their thing, I mean, unless Jesus says to you, stay with that person, then I'm getting out of it. Because that's not a marriage. That's like a death sentence emotionally. So I, you know. And I would say, in that situation, with a heart that's not repentant, Someone had an affair, I don't really care, I'm going to have another one. Um, that's not a marriage. So I do think there's cases where, yeah, I think it probably is the best place to do it. But check this out. Um, whenever divorce is done biblically, whenever there's a separation of the two becoming one, it's always an act of love. Right? First Corinthians 13. So you can still, if your spouse has been unfaithful to you, your spouse has been abusive, you can still, with tears in your eyes and a heart of, of broken heart, say, listen, I don't want this relationship to end, but for the sake of me and my family and for the sake of you, it needs to. I believe that is still biblical merits for it. Right? Right? And then the last thing I just want to come back to is this. If you are, if you are single, um, Jesus responds. Worship team's coming great. If, if you're single, Jesus responds to Matthew 19 um, when the disciple says it's better for, better for a man not to marry. When the disciples say that, Jesus responds this way. Um, some can receive that and some cannot. Listen, if you're single... Don't feel any pressure to get married. If you're single and you like being single, there's no pressure. If you, if you enjoy the life that you have and you know, God's given you that gift, man, you know, sometimes it can be tough in our church because we do talk a lot about family, we talk a lot about marriage situations or kids. And if you're single or, you know, or divorced, and sometimes that can be tough. And I understand that, but I just want you to understand that, 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 that God would say to you that if, if he gave you the gift, then live that way with joy. And when people like me, I mentioned this first service, come to someone that's single and say, hey, I got someone for you. And, you know, you just got to rebuke me. Right? You just got to, no. <laughs> you just got to say, listen, you know, I'm okay. But if you want to get married, I'm going to help you out. But if you don't, you're okay with that. Right? Does that make sense? So don't feel pressured in that way. God can still work in your life and still work through your life. And, and some have that gift. And you can do a lot for the kingdom of God as a single person. Amen. So be okay with that gift. Celebrate it. And I want to go back to a comment I made, and I think it's important, especially in light of our current culture. I said a moment ago um, that a family needs a man and a wife to raise good, healthy children. And I, I still believe that's the ideal world. I do. But there's also situations, um, especially in the foster care situation and adoption, where you may, you may not, you may be single, right? You might be single or you've been divorced or whatever, but there isn't a family that needs someone to take care of somebody. Let me just say this. <laughs> Even if it's not ideal, it's way better than what they have. Does that make sense? Are you, does that, are you following me? And, and so while I still believe the Bible teaches that, you know, a healthy family has the man and the woman in the family. Sometimes people die and, and you work with what you have and you do the best you can. Sometimes there's situations like foster care and adoption where their life was a mess. And man, you can bring in a lot of hope in life and you should pursue that. So I just want to, I just hope I'm bringing clarity to that. I hope I am. I hope I am. Stand with me if you would. Father, I, I, um, I always get nervous when I hit on topics like this one last week. And 
not nervous because it's not your word, but nervous because I, I just don't want to mess up your word. <laughs> I don't want to mess up what you're saying. And um, Lord, we're sometimes removed from what was happening in that culture. And, and Lord, so anything that I may have said today that uh, didn't line up with you, uh, forgive me for that. But I believe, I believe it was all what you're saying in your word. And so in light of that, in light of that, I, I pray for every, every married couple here today and watching online, God, that you would just give them grace with one another. You'd help them to be one, to fight for one another, to encourage each other, to develop a trust in such a way that they can work through one another's difficulties and they can say, hey, I see this flaw but I see it out of love and I just, I just want to be part of the healing process. And so I, I pray for those in this room who are watching online and they're on the verge of divorce. And, uh, Lord, I pray if possible that, Lord, you bring healing, restoration. And then second, Lord, I know there's um, about half of the people here are divorced. And, and um, Lord, I, I just want to speak life to them. Jesus name that, that, that their best days and you are yet ahead and wherever they are today to go forward and not to live in shame or not to live in yesterday or not to live in what if but just to live today this is where I am and I'm going to give God the rest of my life in this moment I just need that to happen in Jesus name Holy Spirit would you just bring about a sense of great sense of grace in this room uh, right now and those watching online that they would receive the grace of God. And then, Lord, I pray for those that are single and are searching for a spouse. Um, Lord, it's the biggest decision they're going to make. Help them to be patient. Not to be scared, but to be patient. Not to run away from it, but at the same time, not necessarily to run to it. Yes, to take some small calculated risks but to trust you in the midst of it not to date just because it's what all the kids do or all the people do but I, so I pray for that I pray for that in Jesus name everyone said amen, amen. hey next week